we're very happy to see you. Um, this whole session is very interactive, so feel free to get up, go get some more food, go get another drink. If you've got a question, belt it out. These guys would love to answer them as we go. What was that? No food throwing. <laughs> no food throwing, please. Um, again, I appreciate you guys coming. So last week was Agile 2019 conference, and that was in Washington, D.C., and the five of us went, and we were sponsors of the conference, but also entered, uh, went to a lot of the sessions. And that's when we bring our top 10 here to you at these events. And we've done this for, what, about 10 years? 10 years now. And so we're really happy to be in Austin. So now I'd like to introduce everybody. Um, we have Vinayak Joglakar. He is our CTO, and he came here all the way from Pune, India. He is over our development center in India, which has, what, about 500 developers now. And so he's loving all that. Then we have Florence Lowe. She is our COO, and she is based in Dallas, which is where our US headquarters is. Which is not as cool as uh, Austin, but <laughs> we try. We get by. <laughs> and then Mike Watson is our VP of engineering, and he is located here in Austin. And if at any time, like I said, if you want to, to ask any questions or meet with these guys, just let us know. They're always happy to talk with everybody. And of course, most of you know our CE CEO, Hemet Elhens. He is taking a break this year from delivering the session, um, but for good reason. Um, I think you'd enjoy it more. <laughs> she would mean that. So he's just taking a little break this year, this year, and he'll be here to answer any questions also. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Florence, who's going to get things started. Oh, one last thing. I'm sorry. Capital Factory is live streaming tonight's session. So it's going to be on their YouTube channel and probably right now. So um, make sure you smile nicely when you ask, ask a question or what. what the camera is there. Yeah. <laughs> So if you want to ask a question and mention your startup or the company you work for, please yes. do so. And so that also means it will be recorded. So you could, if you missed anything, you could watch it later on demand or forward it to somebody if you think a certain section of it is would be of interest to them. So with that, now I'm turning it over to Florence. Thanks, Jill. Thank you. And thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks again, everyone, for coming. Uh, we'll uh, get started right away. And before I get into my first uh, takeaway, I'm going to share my uh, my pre-first takeaway, which is apparently this is the thing to do. This is what they do in conferences. So take pictures. Of, yes, yes, thank you. Yes. Okay. And we're here, an equal opportunity company here. Thank you. She's only her face. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, so, <clears throat> so what's 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 the first takeaway? Uh, so, like Jill said, we've we've, we've been uh, as a company going to Agile, uh, the annual Agile conference for the last ten years. We've been doing this for the last five years. This is our contribution to the Agile and Texas community. We come here and do this grueling drive from. We do this all day in 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 Dallas, and then and then we drive this morning to uh, to uh, Austin and then tomorrow early morning we're going to be driving down to Houston so, so for those of you who are here for the first time um, uh, so with that the first thing that I wanted to share uh, that I thought was really good was um, was was the first takeaway is you know every battle is won before it is fought we all know this but too often we get caught up in just fighting that battle that we forget this and uh, to illustrate this, I, wanted, I picked out two talks uh, at the, at the uh, conference that I thought was really good. One was a talk on team rooms uh, that rock, uh, given by uh, Kathy Aragon and Alfred Lorber of Sandia National Labs. Um, and the next one is about team agreements by Alex Cannon, who is a coach at USAID right here in Texas. Um, so why is this important for agile software companies? It's about people. We, we put people and collaboration before processes and anything else. And, and, and at the end of the day, we, we work over our, our 15 years um, of Synerzips being in existence, we've worked with over 150 companies 
Uh, Hemant, Mike, Vinayak and I have personally been involved with other startups ourselves. Um, and at any given point in time, we are working with um, about 50 companies. And, and all the issues that we see across all these different uh, uh, groups end up coming down to how well we work together as teams. Uh, so people. Um, I thought this was really good. It, it was worth highlighting. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to read it because I, I thought every word was so good. A growing body of research shows the benefits provided by one's ability to shape the work experience by choosing the type and location of workspace. Results in lower psychological and physiological stress, greater employ employee satisfaction, and ultimately it hits your top line and it hits your bottom line. And we enjoy what we're doing. What a great world that would be. <laughs> so how do we do this? This is, by the way, a two-hour talk, 10 years of experience that I'm distilling into like two and a half minutes. <laughs> so we create agile workspaces. Agile workspaces is a term in the design community uh, where, which, by which they mean that there's a space for collaboration, a, a space where we can focus and do alone work, uh, a space where we can learn, uh, socialize, and respite. None of this is rocket science. You all know this very instinctively. How does that translate uh, for agile teams? <laughs> Bless you. We need stand-up rooms. We need meeting rooms that can be scheduled at short notice without worrying about, you know, is it available? You just walk in and it's occupied. Uh, we need shared work rooms. We need dedicated work rooms. Quick, quick poll. How many here are from large companies, large enterprises, government agencies? So you guys have, yeah. <laughs> and how many from startups or smaller companies? Okay, a, a bit of a mix, more skewing towards the startups and smaller companies. This is Austin. Uh, but I, I did look on the uh, attendee list and there, there are a number of people from larger companies and uh, the larger companies may have this issue of needing to have a shared workroom across different teams. It might not be the same in, in, in a smaller company. You all probably don't need two rooms. <laughs> so how do you go about creating the space? Um, you work with a lot of people. Um, larger companies, there are a lot of departments involved. You get a designer, you, you, you have a lot of people uh, involved who, who need to help. But the key that I thought was really interesting is how they worked with the team. They had some examples where the managers had created what they thought was a nice room for their, their employees, and these are well-meaning managers, but it did not meet the needs of the team at all. So involve the team, find an inspiration. Uh, this was the inspiration the team came up with. Did, can anyone tell me what that is? Sorry, which yes. is that? Yeah, which, yeah, which, yeah, this, uh, this, if I can this, point there. This no. doesn't oh, work. it doesn't Star work. Trek. Okay. <laughs> yes, who said that? <laughs> Very nice. Uh, let's get him a sticker. Star, Star Trek. Trek. Star, Star Trek. Trek. Yeah. The British. Oh, yes, the next generation. Yes. yes. So this was the inspiration the team chose. Um, and, and then they did mock-ups and designs. UX, UI. They, they, they had things they could interact with and look at. Um, and they, they, they solicited requirements from the teams. They had stickies, they had um, categorization, they had dot voting. And, and as they were going through the process, they communicated um, this uh, to everyone on the team. Um, and then they, they conducted surveys, et cetera. So what did they end up with? This. So as you can see, um, they have a lot of collaboration spaces via uh, the huddle rooms, the conference rooms, the open space that, that is reconfigurable. Um, all the walls are whiteboard walls. Um, mm -hmm. And you can't see that, but they have a kitchen for socialization and respite. The, um, the, the interesting thing, the other interesting thing to me about this is if I was designing a room, I would not choose that. To me, it's a little dark, but it works really well for the developers. They love this. So it, it's, 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 it's a space that works really well for, for their use case. So to change tack a little bit, Last year, if you were here last year, you heard us say that uh, we reported to you that teams that are distributed within the same time zone have up to 25% higher productivity. 
anticipate higher productivity in teams distributed elsewhere or teams co-located in the same time zone? Co-located in the same time zone have higher, higher uh, uh, productivity. The minute you're in a different room, it goes down. If you're on a different floor, it goes even further down. If you're in a different building, it continues to go down. So, But if you're in the same time zone, it's better than if you weren't in the same time zone. Instinctively, that makes sense, right? Right, it's just yeah. an, it's an incomplete sentence. Somebody could misread it, so. Yes. <laughs> Productivity, then, then other teams. Um, yeah. So this year, we didn't hear anything different. We, we, uh, this cites a older study, but uh, at 35 feet, you might as well be in a separate building. Clearly, if you're not in the same space, you might as well be anywhere. It doesn't matter. If you're not in the same room together, you might as well be in Mars, maybe. But who's, who, whoever has the luxury to work that way? How many of you have worked with distributed teams? Everyone, right? This is the reality of software development. Uh, we, we are an offshore software development company, but, but even before we work with anyone, the teams are already distributed. And this is for reasons of cost, it's reasons for, of, uh, of, of um, uh, 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 skills and knowledge. In fact, this picture is from another talk I give, uh, I, I reference later, where this company that, that's based in Belgium had people in, in, in the US and, and in Asia. Um, this, is, this is the reality of the world we live in. Um, so with that, I, I just wanted to touch on team agreements a little bit. Uh, so here's the situation. Alex Cannon just joined his firm. Uh, he is with his US-based team in Texas and he has an India-based team in Mumbai. He notices some challenges. The retros are two minutes long. The retros, everyone reports everything is fine. There are no impediments. <laughs> <laughs> he notices a few things. Uh, so he says, let's solve this issue. I see what's wrong, let me provide feedback. What do you think happened? Everybody's yeah. saying, we wanna get out of here, leave. Don't say anything. <laughs> Don't say anything. Yes, yeah, stop. <laughs> um, it, it it didn't go so well. He didn't he didn't have it didn't have the desired uh, effect. He didn't solve the problem. So let's start again. What do we do? New step one: build trust. This came from a lot of conversations in the metro in the retros, just getting real about about and starting with himself, right? Who is Alex? What is my family? These are some challenges that I'm having personally. Traffic was horrible. It was raining. Whatever. You know, getting people to start talking and being really real with people because these are all human beings. And uh, the, the next step was uh, giving everyone a voice. Don't just have, um, especially in a situation where you have two different teams in different parts of the world, don't have one person be a spokesperson for the team because it, it inhibits the flow of knowledge and the team, team members really getting um, to become a part of the uh, team. So what do they do? Uh, what kinds of things that they did they do or what values did they use? They really use Scrum values to align. Safety to speak your mind. Uh, everyone speaks. Simple things like enunciate. Mute yourself when you're not talking. Uh, confirm your understanding. There's a very funny video of a conference call that we've all been, been at. Um, if you Google it, you'll find it. Or, or come find me. I'll, I'll pull it up on my phone and I'll show you. Um, but uh, it, these are all very simple things that need to be done. Lessons learned, learn from your journey, leverage scum values, evolve your working agreements. Did I say we were gonna talk about team agreements? It's actually not about team agreements. It's about how you get to the team agreements, how you get the buy-in from everyone. We all know how to do team agreements. How do we really get everyone to buy in? That's my main takeaway. And if you can do that, this is what you do. You build an awesome team like this. You all know who this is, right? Yes. Okay, good. Um, yes, with that, I'm going to pass it to Mike, who's going to talk to us about what else is needed. Yeah, so hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, thanks, Florence. Yes. So I'm going to talk about empathy and leadership, you know, topic very uh, well known to David over there. Um, hopefully, I do it justice. Uh, so I'm going to start with a story. I'm going to try to go through it quickly. Um, but essentially, up in Alaska, southeast Alaska, um, the folks that were there at the time happened to be Russians. Um, hunted all the 
um, otters out of the area. And because of that, that turned the um, environment into this sort of wasteland of sea urchins. And the reason why is because otters eat sea urchins, and without otters to kill sea urchins, the sea urchins ate all the kelp, and without the kelp, basically killed off the, the ecosystem. And so uh, about 1960, they brought otters back from another region. They brought a whole bunch of them and repopulated the area. And what that did is it created, it rebuilt the ecosystem. Ultimately, we ended up with lush underwater forests, and it brought back the, not only the otters and the kelp, but also helped boom, for instance, the eagle population. Because there was more fish in the area, eagle population grew over that time 20 or 30 percent. So it was good for the entire environment. So what they, they call this a key, keystone species. So a species that, when introduced into the environment, actually more than, you know, does better than just being there in the environment, right? It actually helps other species do more and be stronger. And so this is a very important concept. Um, so Keystone Habits. So if anyone has read this book, which I haven't, but it's on my desk, The Power of Habit, <laughs> <laughs> um, he ta uh, the author here, Charles uh, Duhigg, he talks about um, certain habits um, create reactions that you know make your life better in ways that are unexpected, right? And the obvious example is you start exercising, mm -hmm. then you start eating better, and then all of a sudden, you know, things just start going a lot better for you. So there's this, this concept of these keystone species or keystone habits exist. So what does that mean? Well, the, the speaker that I went and talked to, he brought these two ideas together and brought it into the agile world and said, hey, maybe the presence of empathy in leaders and in the team in general is what causes that environment to thrive. Right? If everyone is being empathetic to each other, then you're going to get a strong ecosystem. And if you have the opposite, you probably kill off the ecosystem. And I think we've all experienced that. I'm guessing, you know, both ends of that. Like in places where everyone's working well together, very strong organization, and you're able to achieve milestones that you didn't think were possible. So this was my main takeaway: is um, having this empathy and building these strong teams, having a lot of trust within the teams is going to make for the most powerful results, right? You're going to achieve probably more than you ever expected. Just a little bit more on empathy. Um, it comes in three different forms according to um, Jamil Zaki. I have not read this book and it is not on my desk. Um, <laughs> but it probably will be soon. Um, but Because um, empathy is actually an important topic to me. It's something that I've really tried to develop over my career as a leader. Uh, but it comes in three forms. Uh, just quickly, it's sharing, which is the idea of um, you know talking to someone and maybe sharing a cry with someone and like making them uh, feel better that way. Thinking about, which is really like getting in the shoes of the person, like wearing their moccasins, as commonly said. And then there's caring about, which is actually doing something, right? So going <coughs> going somewhere and actually helping someone um, improve their situation. So these are the three forms of empathy. Um, finally, uh, oh yeah, so. Let's talk about some advantages. Um, these might be obvious, you may have already seen these, but you're gonna have more productive teams. You're gonna be able to deal with diversity and uh, you know, a broader spectrum of people by having empathy for them. And then ultimately what you wanna do is have backbone and heart. So the, uh, what they're talking about, and actually this is in the Zaki book, is they're not, backbone and heart aren't opposite, right? They're actually two different dimensions. We're trying to show here, and you want to have both. So you want to have conviction. You know, you have goals. You want to have conviction in those goals, but you also want to listen to your people and adapt to how the people are feeling and how how you can best work as a team. So, be an empathetic leader. Uh, your leadership values will cast a shadow. It'll bring up the the whole team. They'll all start being empathetic as well, and you'll have the best possible organization. And then just one last thing, there's a bunch of habits, you can look at this later, that can help you develop this. Are the slides going to be provided or something? Or? Yes. Okay. You'll have access to them. Thanks. Mike, can I add a couple of things? So yes, please. one of the key advantages of empathy from the work that I've done is if you are empathetic, you inspire others to be honest because you can actually hear the truth from them. If you're not empathetic, they hide the truth from you. Yes. So benefit of empathy is you get truth. Benefit of truth is you can actually empathize. They're self-supporting each other. Right? And between the two, you end up building trust. 
and you know, trust for me in business terms is quality. Right? So mm -hmm. if you're trying to create quality, and empathy is something that you as a leader could actually do, you don't need other people to do that. And the way yeah, I would exactly. describe that is respectful understanding. So now you can solve this potentially positive building spiral by actually ha taking the time to respectfully understand where the person talking to you is coming from. And, that, and if you're able to do that, they're more likely than not to tell you uh, more truth. And it's, it's interesting you say that because just to dive a little bit into these habits, the first three habits require no interaction with anybody. They're self, you're, lo you're looking at yourself and how you behave around other people. So that's exactly your point, right? You can do a lot of this without ever having to interact with another person. In other words, you're empowered. Yes. Right? This is not something yeah. dependent on others for you to do. Correct. Uh, just out of curiosity, number four, is that asking them, asking yourself? Yeah, so if someone them? has a really negative reaction, good question. If someone has a really negative reaction or a really strange reaction, mm -hmm. you can say, where is that coming from? Because there's probably some need that's not being met or some issue that they're having that you don't understand mm -hmm. that's creating this reaction. And so by digging in and figuring out what's really causing them to have this, this reaction helps mm -hmm. you get to the truth that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes, the next one, help people empty their cup. So that's, um, <laughs> that one's a little bit difficult okay. to describe, but the idea is if you're the one always talking, then, then you have a full cup, right? You're not, you're not taking in, you're not able to take in any information because you're the one too busy giving out the information. So your cup becomes full. It's a kind of a Chinese proverb thing. Have you heard of it before? I, I would describe it as there's two states, either you're expressing or you're listening. If you're only expressing, you've missed, you've missed the listening. Yeah, yeah, and that's the full cup. And yeah. so you want to you wanna help someone empty their cup. So you I, should be listening more than you're talking. Yeah, basically that's the idea. Where does body language get in there? Don't, they, obviously that person didn't discuss it before. Uh, they did not talk about it, but I mean, it's part of, part of it's part. communication is your body language, your tone, like all of this matters, right? If you have a negative tone and you're saying a positive thing, it's going to sound really negative. I mean, we all know that. But so, I mean, it's a, you have to think about all the factors. But I think if you're naturally empathetic, it's just your body language is going to follow with what you're saying. But there are some very clever little body, littler body languages. Of course, yeah. I mean, and, and, and that's why face-to-face -face interactions are always better because you can pick up on those because you may be something like say saying something very positive or very negative but you could be smiling or you know like you could have the opposite actual bottle language and so maybe you're being sarcastic right but you can't tell that on a text or an email or a conference call so you, you know always starting at basics yeah ask yeah ask and so that you know that part of empathy is actually a dialogue and, and then i would offer one warning on body language that it is cultural so it's also important to understand the cultural mix, especially if we have international teams. Yeah, right. good point. Um, and, and it also is, you know, the experience of the person, like um, there's the joke, how can you tell an introverted engineer from an extroverted engineer? An extroverted engineer is looking at your shoes. <laughs> it, 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 can, it can depend on the style of the team you're working with. Right? So, um, there are there are cult, there are real cultural characteristics to body language. Just and again, if you're confused, ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. That's good advice. Yeah. Any other questions? Seems to be an interesting topic. I wonder how empathy is played with um, conversing with people who tend to stonewall. Yeah. So stonewalling is is a behavior that's caused by lack of trust, right? So. Mm -hmm. You have to break through that. And you know, you mentioned that on yours. Is like you need to talk, open a dialogue, go to coffee. Like I remember in one of my jobs, we used to, we were in Seattle, lots of coffee shops. There was four within two blocks of my office, and we'd just go on walks, and that was a way to break down those barriers and and figure out why they're like I said, their needs are probably not being met in some way. Like maybe they, maybe there's something that's going on under the covers that you need to just figure out better. But. Um, it's not an easy answer, right? People might stonewall for many different reasons. Mm -hmm. So you just gotta figure out what that is. And you're not gonna solve that in one go, right? It's gonna take a long time. Do you, uh, if the possible reason might be Andy, what could you do about that? Um, if it's envy, well, again, it's, you have to build trust. 
I'm not an expert psychologist, so I can't really answer that at a deep level, but, <laughs> but essentially, um, you know, building trust. Somehow you have to figure out how to build trust so that you don't have that empathy anymore, right? Like get rid of whatever needs aren't being met that causes that, figure out how to, how to sort those out. If they would love to talk about it, communication, yeah. They're yeah, kind of to open sometimes up. it's like, hard. Some people yeah, are hard. This is why a lot of what we're talking about here has to be with these topics. Mm -hmm. How do you make good software with good people? And we're yeah. all good people. Yeah, and you have, to, have, have to bring it out of team. ourselves and each other. Yeah, and ultimately all the people working together makes for a stronger team. Yeah. So I'm going to pass it to Benayak. Hey, uh, thanks. So we have some thanks, topics Mike. to cover. You're yeah. welcome. Yeah. So I'll, this time, uh, this before I go to the UX design, you know, I have some uh, interesting things to share. That we had a keynote address, and you know, uh, agile. I always felt is about experimentation, right? So we always conducted experiments with teams and uh, with organizations, but. We heard a keynote address where the experiments were done by the individual with himself. Now, one of the experiments that he carried out was, how can you bore yourself? What is, you know, you really want to bore yourself down, so what will you do? So the experiment, uh, I'll just give you two funny examples that he shared. So one of the experiments that he carried out uh, to bore himself was, to read the iTunes usage terms, mm -hmm. word by word. So that's one of the experiments. And the other one was even funnier. He called uh, American Airlines and said that he has lost luggage. And then they put him on hold, and he heard <laughs> the music. <laughs> yeah. There's some other, I mean, I, and we'll go through that. That's my last takeaway. So. I covered it now so that you wait till the last one, yeah. <laughs> right? So I, I'm going to talk uh, about takeaways about user experience, and I have been covering that in the uh, last uh, year as well as the year before last. How much of software that we build after spending millions of dollars is really used? So 37% uh, of apps that are downloaded are never opened. People download the apps and then they never used, right? And of the remaining 60 per 63%, 60% of the features are never used, right? So there's a whole lot of money that we are spending and users are not using that. So that's the reason why I am so passionately uh, talking about user experience every year. So uh, the two topics we I'm going to cover about user experience. One is uh, having user experience design within this sprint. So earlier we talked about uh, doing user experience in a UX or a design sprint first, and then continuing that, uh, you know, with it's like a handoff, like a waterfall model. <coughs> and then you continue with that design. So that's what someone talked about last year. I had covered it last year. So instead of that, why don't we do it as a cross-functional team, right? That's the idea. Mm -hmm. So have a UX designer sit along with your developer, your QA, your DevOps person. Have a UX designer in the team, maybe part-time. How's the idea? OK, so uh, you know, getting you get real-time feedback and improve upon not only whether you're satisfying the acceptance criteria laid down by your product owner, but actually go to the end user and see by uh, the user experience uh, designer interviewing the end user whether the end user is getting the desired outcome or not, which is much more valuable so that we end up building products that are actually used, right? So that's the idea behind having a user experience designer within the team. Do you think it's a brilliant idea? Yeah. Have you seen a user experience designer? <laughs> Any of you? Yeah? Ponytails, Mac, right? <laughs> Shorts. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, the trouble it's is in the morning. You know, morning. It's a tough one, right? So here's what, here was this, here, here was the scrum team says about user experience designers. They take too long. You know, 
they they creative people they say you can you can't bind creativity by schedules you can't say that you do it and you come up with something in a week not possible they create unrealistic requirements you know they say that okay this is something which i want to this is this is my dream go go build it now how how is it possible right the design polish is nice to have but not a must have i mean it's functionally i can build something but the the, the kind of polish the amount of the time and energy and efforts they spend is too much i don't want to labor through the whole list look at what the team looks like you know jeans t-shirt and then they probably use ubuntu mac uh, ubuntu laptop probably a dell and you know <laughs> they <laughs> sorry <laughs> uh, and then what they say uh, the ux designers say that demand final and signed off design right you tell us what you want how can i tell him what i want when i don't know what i want right i'm still working on it it's it's the ideas are still evolving my creative juices still flowing my work isn't there product backlog no you you have product backlog in which you show show cards but now if if you ask a user experience designer what did he do today he is unable to stand up in the scrum and say that this is what i did today and this is what i he he is just saying that okay i am trying to you know dream of things i am letting my mind wander or something like that i mean for which you got to pay him whatever top dollars right so which is crazy but you know that's what ux designers want i have nothing to add or say to their daily scrum so if you see like you know a daily scrum and you have i have a ux designer in the scrum meeting he is generally standing not in the circle but outside and it's obviously is uh, sticking out like a sore thumb because he's really not a part of it so that's the problem right so what is the solution so how many of you were a uh, were in those days still uh, working in companies where they used to have uh, qa and development in separate silos right now today they work together don't they right these two were totally different animals wired differently one was breaking and the other one was making right <laughs> and how did you get them to work together yeah you gave them time you put them in a room and say you figure out that's what you need to do here you have to give them time you have to work together so that's the solution for this for having a good cross functional team so this is a summary of solution bring us and them uh, instead of uh, you know the us and them it should be we right treat all workforce as first class and important work so on and so forth there are multiple i would i don't want to go through the whole list these slides will be on so this is the summary or the take away <coughs> for this i want to cover one more thing in the user experience design that is a concept of business agility so this time in the conference they talked about business agility the this is a new stage that got started so we build products <laughs> or we build businesses what are we here for we are building products what are the products for because we want to build businesses right so focusing our attention more on business just the way you have a product owner you have a business owner who this role sits on top of the product owner role and helps you define what is really needed by business right so we'll talk a little bit more about the role so the business agility as a concept is more about adapting quickly to market changes internally and externally right responding rapidly to flexibility flexibly to customer demands so bringing agility in how you respond to the market conditions right not to the not just to the requirements a uh, change in requirements but how uh, your organization respond to the change in market conditions how you adapt and lead change in productive and cost effective way without compromising quality adapting and continuously be at competitive advantage so these are some of the things that characterize business agility as compared to how do we respond to this change <laughs> <laughs> <The water boy? laughs>
<laughs> yeah, there's water boiling. Yeah. Okay, all right. So, <laughs> I think someone needs to take care of that because, yeah, I can ask this gentleman, right? So, uh, you know, what does a business owner do and what he doesn't do? That is summarized in this slide. So, uh, you know, what it is, it's a role, right? It's not like business owner is, right, doesn't actually own equity in the business, it's a role. What it is not, it's not a position. It's not a designation that entitles the business owner to own the business, no. It's just like product owner that is a role that is played. It's like, uh, you know, more like a program manager. The next slide will make it a little more clear, right? So he is more, uh, who is a visionary, who provides, who is a business coach, who is a facilitator, and less like somebody who is, uh, you know, a leader or a manager like who's managing the project. It's more like facilitation, less like command and control. What he does, he does business strategy, planning, evolution, review. What he doesn't do is specific product strategy, right? He gives a overall big picture to the product owners, product managers, but he doesn't decide the specific product strategy, right? He imposes assumptions, that these are the assumptions. Uh, he doesn't impose assumptions. And he's absent uh, from activities. So this is, so let me show you the model. This is known as the business accelerator model. On this side, this side, you have the levels. So here's the business owner level. This is the product level. Right? This is the process level and this is the people level. And then you have organizations which evolve. These are the three stages of evolution. Right? Now, you have at the lowest level digital culture, agile culture, all that cultural things for the individuals or people. At the next level, you have the processes such as Kanban, Scrum, and all that. And at the next level, you have at the initial stage, you have a product owner with team members, then you might have a couple of product owners with a couple of teams. Or finally, you may have a product manager with product owners reporting to him. And at the top level, you have the sponsor and the business owner. So you have product managers and product owners who report to the business owner. And the business owner is giving the overall direction of the business strategy, and he leaves it leaves it to the product owners and product managers to decide the specific product strategy. So that's the role of a product owner. So, which I found interesting because finally, we are not building just products, we are building businesses. So that's the takeaway. With that, I'll let Florence take the next one. Thanks, Vinak. So uh, before one of us falls and breaks our neck in front of all of you, <laughs> one is out of the way. <laughs> Most likely will be me. <laughs> I am. <laughs> but um, okay, so we know a lot about uh, UX and, 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 and diverse teams, right? Diversity of, of skill set that we bring in and, and the role of business owner. Um, so to me, uh, you, this is still the core takeaway for me. Um, we still have to plan before every battle. So, how do we do that? This was a very interesting uh, talk. Again, all of you know all of this. You've all been in multiple work sessions. This was a wonderful work session by Angie Doyle and Talia Lancaster. They're out of, um, out of South Africa. And they gave a very practical uh, workshop on, um, on, on how to get teams to come together. So I love this from their abstract, uh, from the abstract of their talk. They say, getting new teams to work together is hard, really hard. Um, and is it because we forget that it's actually the people that do the work? You know, when you try to impose something on them, it's 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 hard for them to understand and ad adopt uh, what what we've imposed on them and adapt to wherever they are. Um, so they say we believe the key to high performance teams is creating an intentional culture that respects and embraces diversity. If you don't like the term diversity, we can say everyone that respects and embraces everyone. Um, and high performance teams is 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 what we all want to be a part of, correct? 
uh, apart from the fact that high performance teams create value, right? That's 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 really where we all want to spend our time. Um, so very practical, a team canvas. I'm sure you all have seen this or some variant of this. What I liked about what they what they said it did was the, the slides are going to go out. All the links will go out, and and we can provide more links if you want for references. But the key to me on this was working through each of this with the team, with everyone on the team. You know, it's not just the leadership working through this and then telling the organization, here is our, uh, here is how we're gonna work. Working through each of these, I, I've, I've numbered them, we'll go through a few of them. So for purpose, for instance, um, you know, uh, if, if, if some of you are founders here, you know, you've spent a lot of time trying to think about what your problem statement is, what your solution is, and how it's different from everything else. Have all of your team work on this, so they really get good buy-in. Uh, and, and they might have an insight that you didn't, possibly. Um, so uh, the problem statement, our unique skills, how we make the world a better place. Pen and paper, write it down. Everyone write, write it down and, and then talk about it. And then come to that common team understanding <coughs> of it. At larger organizations, it's about what you're doing for, for your specific team. At a startup, it's it's the whole shebang. It's your, it's your, it's your, it's your company. Um, this was another one. Uh, this we actually did at the table that, that I was at. Uh, to, to, to identify your common goals, they had this really wonderful board game uh, where you work through um, smart goals and you, and you ask each other questions that you pull from, from, from these uh, decks of cards. And as you pull those questions, each of you answers the question. And, and you come up with uh, a, a con sort of a consensus on uh, the problem that you're trying to solve. In this case, the problem we were trying to work through is how to increase the social media reach, a very vague uh, goal uh, of this new product. And uh, they, ha they throw wild cards in there, which is interesting, uh, because we had one come up in, in our round, and as we were going through, I've, I've done startups myself, bootstrap startups, and. Um, and, and we work with a lot of companies that are, uh, some that are on the smaller scale, mostly that are a little bit bigger, but on the smaller scale, uh, I'm, I'm, and, and even the bigger ones, we're all resource constrained, as are some of the larger projects I know, but we're all resource constrained. And so my first instinct was, look, I have you know, 20 plus years of business experience, I've worked with startups, I've worked with small companies, we need to do this ourselves, let's do this ourselves. His wild card said something different. His wildcard said, think like a rock star. We didn't know this. So he threw out there, what if, let's go out and hire the best firm that is out there. We're like, no, you're crazy. That's, that's, that's a bit, you know, you're being collaborative. You're in a workshop. You're in Washington, D.C. So we, were, we, we played nice and we listened to him. And then at the end of it, he revealed that that, that was what his, his role was. And it was really interesting because we did have a good conversation about that. And, and, and it got us thinking, and it got me thinking. I'm like, wait, maybe I was too afraid in some of my startups. Maybe we should think bigger. Um, but always be smart about that. <laughs> the next one was identifying your personal goals. Uh, you, you all know SMART goals, SMART. Uh, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, time bound. Smarter, evaluate and rethink. So it's ready well for our agile community, right? You, you always want to go back and rethink your goals. Uh, again, this is an exercise you work work through with the rest of your team. Maybe you share it with them. Maybe you share some of it with them. But it really helps in getting to know each other, and building that trust, and building that empathy. Um, uh, how do we communicate and keep everyone up to date? We all know variations of this, and we all try variations of this. Um, but just going through in some excruciating detail with, again, the entire team. Uh, you can use uh, the Scrum Kickoff Planner. It, it's kind of cut off, but Adam Weishat has a really good um, uh, 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 template that you can use. And going through that uh, in, in some detail is useful. And it's not one person writing this down and deciding what's gonna be done, it's the, the team deciding what's gonna be done. So we won't go over every aspect, but what is the key? Work through it with the team. Make it fun and get real alignment. Real alignment comes through lots of conversations when the guards come down. Guards come down when real trust is formed. 
and real trust is formed when people get to know each other. Um, and that's where magic happens. <coughs> it's hard. We all have to do it. If we do it, we do it well. It'll be fun. And we'll get some great results. Is that? Uh, again, what does this have to do with agile people? I got asked this question once, so <laughs> uh, it's all about people. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike. All right. To talk about metrics. Yes. I'm measuring some Thank of this. Thank you, Florence. All this so, fluffy. Yeah. So I'm diverting from uh, <laughs> topics like empathy and team building, and we're going to talk about metrics. And uh, so I like this quote from John. He's basically like. He, in his presentation, he's like, you know, there's this book definition of what uh, what metrics are for, and it's very boring and you know expansive and long. And he's like, why don't we just make it simple? Like, let's build good stuff and measure how we build that good stuff, so we can get better at building good stuff. And I thought that was really good, right? Let's keep it simple, and that's probably what we should do with the metrics as well. Uh, so metrics can be evil, and that's because of this concept of perverse incentives, right? So good. Good intentions driving bad behavior. So let's put a measurement on this so that we can, you know, see if we're doing a good job. But then it ends up being, you know, a negative consequence for the team. And so he has this concept of, you know, people talk about gaming the system, but it's really putting the measurement, putting the target on the the system that's actually the game, right? So the managers create the game. It's not that the employees are gaming the system. I thought this was a very good observation. So if you walk away from here, good intentions driving bad behaviors. Managers gaming the system, it's not the employee's fault, right? So don't put targets on it. That's really the idea. Use metrics to get better, but don't use metrics to measure people, right? That's, that's very important. Um, quickly about velocity, so Doc, um, he, uh, yeah, everyone's been asked for more velocity, right? I mean, who hasn't? <laughs> um, he's saying don't use it as a metric, right? This is a very common mistake. People are like, well, we got this nice little number here. Let's just try to make that number bigger every time. But really, it's not intended for that at all. So don't do that. But you can use it for planning. It's actually intended for that, and it's very good for that. Um, so here's a bunch of metrics. The good ones and the, or the evil ones and the less evil ones that I'm going to describe it because probably they're all ultimately evil in some way. But the point here of this is not any of these specifics, but these metrics here, if you look at them carefully, are actually measuring how the system is dysfunctional, not how people are dysfunctional, right? So that's the key, right? Look for measurements that are going to help you remove problems in the system. That's ultimately what we're talking about. And like I said, these slides are available if you want to look at these. But um, I'll just quickly. So finally, just to wrap it up, I've already kind of mentioned this, but another uh, is the measure the work, not the people. I think that's a very key takeaway. Measure the work, not the people. Make the system better. Don't try to figure out who's not doing a good job. Most people want to do a good job, so just assume that that's what they're going to do. Um, build, tr build trust and be transparent. I mean, obviously that's important. I mean, that's how that's going to work. But the being transparent part is really about Explain why you're doing the metrics, right? Let's talk through it. Let's make it a team exercise. Let's not have it be a top-down decision. And then finally, if you can tie your measure, measurements to the company mission, like how does this thing, making this thing better, actually help the company and the world, right? Some, some missions of some companies are actually changing the world. So if you can tie all that together, it's going to be even better for you. Yes? Do you have a way to help people identify how they're measuring other people so they don't do it? Um, <laughs> do I have a, um, I mean, it, it's, they it's might really. Be doing it, I mean, they might be continuously doing it because maybe that's how they're. Yeah, they're trained to do it. it. Or, you know, you're supposed to make your SMART goals. And so it's like, hey, let's have your, you know, velocities go up by one step next week. Um, if you but, don't know how to identify that, then, you know, if your people don't know how to identify Yeah, so, so here's, you know, ideas on here that are kind of obviously in this direction is um, team satisfaction, right? I mean, measure that. Like, how happy is the team? That's a, probably a pretty good indication if you're doing the right thing or not. Um, defect backlog, not like number of defects, but just like how many, you know, what's, what's their visibility into the defects. Throughput variance is actually really important right now in the Agile community. People talked about this where 
It's how consistently do we actually achieve throughput and why aren't we consistently doing it if we're not? So it's not really about what your throughput is, it's about how reliably are you producing this throughput. And then that's less about the people, right? That's more about the system. Does that help? Well, I, um, I'm guessing like, you know, the, the worst case where you catch someone or an employee or a coworker um, measuring other people, do you step in and go, oh, wait a minute, I see that you're measuring someone else and you can't Yeah, that. yeah, systematically, so, yeah, you'd have to do so, that as, as a leader or as someone that has an influence in the organization, looking for, for instances where people do this and just weeding it out of the system, yeah. I think, I think the empathy and leadership is a, is a great place to start, like how the leaders within an organization kind of radiate the culture that needs to happen yes. is one, and then I think the other is any metrics that, that happen then, if you, can, if, if you can really get the whole team to, to decide what those metrics will be, you know, because the team is made, made up of uh, individuals and it might be made up of their leaders as well who may need to achieve goals or uh, you know have different objectives. Have everyone have that conversation, and then people understand and know, and then there is trust, and and then whatever gets decided will ultimately be better. More more heads are always better than one. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but so, not easy. So I think just having a culture where people aren't being punished. They call it, actually I didn't mention this, but they call it punitive measures, right? So don't, don't make these measurements punitive, right? Don't tie it to your performance rating because that's, that's when they start being destructive. Mike, you have a question? Oh, sorry. Uh, yes. You had uh, tied metrics to com uh, company mission. Was that the customer customer, the customer mission, or was that your own? No, your own company's mission. Software development. Your own company's mission in this case, assuming it's a product company. Yeah. So for us at Sinners, we, we, we should have our own mission. I mean, we have our own mission, and, and we, we, will, we, we should measure to it as well. And part of our mission is making our customers uh, and clients happy. And it's the same for every company. You know, it's every company is, uh, these are the goals I'm trying to achieve, and part of the goals that I'm trying to achieve are make my, my customers and my employees, all my stakeholders happy. Uh, and when you can do that, that's, that's a beautiful, virtuous cycle. Would, would you agree? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so the point is if someone is, feels their work is connected to the bigger picture, they're going to be much more productive. They're going to be more happy to go to work the next day. So that's kind of the point. Uh, I, I'm just wondering, because in the team talk and all that, uh, no one's talked about marketing. And <clears throat> it seems maybe that's where a lot of that tug of war arises. Because the marketing person gets uh, involved in the success of his customer. Mm -hmm and maybe even gets more business when they're successful in their corporate recognition. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not seeing any of that, so you get the, into these wars between marketing and marketing. Yeah. yeah, I mean... I think there's a lot of internal wars, too. Yeah, yeah that it's happens. Not just, it's, not just, it's not just in marketing, it's internally as well. Oh, yeah, the executives. But, yeah, but I, I think part of the point is if they're aligned to the same common goals of the company, the same mission, then there, you'll have less of that, right? Because everyone's incentivized to work together for the greater good. That's ultimately what you're trying to achieve. Now, all of us in this room, some of us might be closer to the top of the tree than the others, but like, it's difficult to make that happen from the bottom up. I mean, that's really kind of a co corporate culture kind of thing. But you gave the cut tie at the beginning. Maybe that has to be some sort of function. And that is to keep the customer happy. And it could be by level. Uh, yep. It is for the customer turning a profit, making more money for the stock, stock uh, 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 Happiness for a, a, a person in the pit, and, you know, handling, rescheduling doctor's appointments and things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. it, her happiness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ultimately, you're trying to make everyone feel like they matter, right? And you know you can do that. Your customers are going to be happy. Like if you have a happy organization, it's actually proven that your customers are going to be happier, and then that's going to lead to better bottom line. Yes. Um, do you have a slide that describes like um, a why uh, a particular metric is in it, the evil column versus <laughs> the less evil column? 
I we do, should do a we should do a well, webinar on this. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. can <laughs> actually it might be good for us to reach out to the, the guy who did this, John Tanner. He um, yeah. and he have this was an hour and fifteen minute yeah. presentation. He had a lot of information right? mm -hmm. I just tried to distill it down to uh, but he does actually show examples of these and how, how to structure them and, and also talks about why some of them are evil. Uh, but mostly because of the evil ones are almost always because you're measuring somebody, right, or a team. And you're like stage gate performance. I don't know if anyone has been in that before, but it's basically where are we at on the project? We're 47% complete, but we're supposed to be 62% complete, and now you're busted. We've got to work weekends to catch up. I mean, that's, that's not helpful, right, ultimately. What's better than that is, um, you know, how, how far away are we from the finish line? And what is it costing us not to be there yet? That's, those are things that are more interesting to measure. Okay, I think I'm going to pass the baton. Yes. All right. Yeah, we literally have one. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, think one more, one more, sorry. All right. So, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, DevOps. So, DevOps is a piece which enables you to build user experience by continually de delivering small product increments and testing them in the hands of the end user. So I'm very passionate about DevOps. So uh, building a CI CD pipeline was a topic uh, and, you know, uh, for building microservices. So these small product increments, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the new change that is happening that you have small product increments which are you know vertical slices called microservices which are good at doing one thing and you know delivering these microservices in a continuing continual way uh, in just the way we talked about doing CI and CD uh, for monoliths you can actually build so there are certain patterns that uh, Richard Mills talked about which are very interesting patterns to follow the takeaways and so this is a set of tools that you can look up the slide that are typically used in a continuous delivery pipeline for microservices. But these are some of the patterns. So the pipeline code, I try to make better user experience by using this pointer, right? Instead of. <laughs> <laughs> so pipeline code follows branching strategy. Like, you know, you have number of branching and merging happening in your code. Like you have hot fixes, release branches, future feature branches. So let your pipeline code also follow the same branching strategy. Don't, you, you can't have the pipeline code in the trunk and, you know, then try to make it work with uh, specific branches. Pre-merge with master. So when you, when, before merging, test it. So, because pipeline needs to be tested. So how do you test the pipeline? By pre-merging it and running it in, uh, deploying it in an ephemeral environment, a virtual environment, maybe on the cloud, specifically meant for this purpose. Before merging, test whether the pipeline works and then only you merge it. Each service has its own pipeline, right? So if they, there are multiple microservices, each microservice will have its own pipeline. It will have the same version number as the microservice has and full stack developers. So you have uh, vertical slices in which you have developers working on both the user interface as well as the API. So backend and frontend developers. Who, so, uh, you know, thinking of, uh, we will be talking a little bit about what we call as a bounded context, thinking of the entire uh, microservice which does one good thing, at, uh, which is good at doing one thing. It, one individual thinking about it and delivering it from back to front end himself works out much better. So having full stack developers is another good pattern. So that these were the main takeaways and you know, uh, this picture again shows the way the pipeline works and how it is promoted from test to uh, dev to test and from test to production. So. I will not go through this diagram. There's a lot of detail in this, uh, but you can refer to this and the talk by Richard Mills. Uh, you can look up Richard Mills online. Mills? Yes. Mills, M-I-L-L-S, Mills. Is it CI, uh, continuous? 
integration. continuous integration, integration as you do in case of uh, Jenkins kind of thing, right? Yeah. So with that, uh, let's come to the next talk again on DevOps, which was about telemetry. How do you monitor these microservices? Because each application, uh, you, you, could, you could step through the application using some kind of debugging tool when you had end-to-end -end one monolith, right? But then now you have microservices handing off control from one to the next to the next to the next and you don't know. They may be in different uh, locations, running on different servers on the cloud, in different availability zones in different regions. So how do you affect traceability? So for which traceability, observability, and monitoring has become uh, very important and it has its own special tools. So before we go there, I have a question. Which one of this is an evil metric? <laughs> you talked about evil metrics, right? Evil. Evil, evil metrics, evil. which is, which one of this is, uh, do you think, so this was an experiment carried out. It's a, uh, Garden Grove experiment in which they actually wanted to see which metric or which way will finally work well for uh, actually effectively slow down the traffic. So what do you think? I love to give control. Uh, those who well, think they the control... The officer. The con <laughs> <laughs> That's a big key of whether that works or not. <laughs> this one? Yeah, no, I'm saying, if, if can you see the police officer? It kind of looks hiding. like it's a little bit hide, hiding there. So You're that right. probably doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so even, even otherwise, I mean, uh, let's, let's forget that uh, for the time being, this is a good observation, you caught it well. But, uh, you know, let's say that, you know, you have a gun and you know it, right? And then that's a punitive kind of matrix. Whereas here's something where you get the control yourself. So the experiment finally reached a conclusion that you know, you're know you driving the same speed gun, but you're allowing the end user to make that decision. That, okay, let me slow down and let me, you know. So which works better in the end for, uh, you know, actually the number of uh, vehicles which followed this was better for a number of reasons. So telemetry is something about measuring and showing you logs, traces, and getting you to uh, understand the way your application is behaving and the way your bits and bytes are moving through the network. So, Did I, did you have a question? Yeah. Oh, actually, the, well, the two examples, the first one, only one person knows the speed limit using that mm -hmm. machine, whereas the second one, it's the driver and everyone else driving be behind that person, which is peer pressure. So sure. yeah. That's so a good a good point. I don't know whether you're audible at the end, but what she's saying, your she is okay, right? So yeah. the so there was a question. On that. The both yeah. both of them are measuring people, but yeah. the second one gives more visibility to yeah. Yeah. Um, the person who is doing that. Yeah, yeah. So he 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 has there. to appear responsible in front of the community. <laughs> Of other drivers. Yeah. Yeah. But there, I, I think that if his definition of evil versus less evil is measuring people, it is still doing that. So yeah. I don't know how to answer this question. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if you noticed that Google Maps slowed down and got a little less effective over the last uh, two, three months. Mm -hmm. But they worldwide, globally rolled out your speed and the speed limit of where you're driving. And it's now on your Google Maps display. When you're were there results from this experiment as to whether police or these public meters reduced? Yeah, the public meters work better. Okay. Yeah. And overall reduced. Overall. Speed, yeah. Yeah. Speed How did they measure the speed reduction? Uh, How did they know, I guess, that people were speeding? Yeah, yeah. Probably the experiment also had the. I mean, I don't know the details. I, I'll have to ask uh, probably those who carry it out. So. Somewhere to monitor yeah. that. So, or repeat it then. Uh, so you can so look up Garden Grove experiment on right. Google and probably you'll find okay. how it was conducted so, and the details about it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, uh, moving on, uh, you know, what does a telemetry 
ecosystem look like. So you have uh, on each of the microservices, you have a sidecar that is kind of a sensor which is collecting all the data, which could be using FluentD or Envoy or some, and then that sensor passes what are the data, it could be the CPU load or what are the matrix that it is gathering. It passes on and then there is an aggregator which creates the summary of it. And then you have presentation layer where you use uh, tools like Grafana or Kibana where you are actually able to uh, see the dashboard and draw your own conclusions and uh, you know take actions using a scheduler. So it could be either Elastic or Prometheus or InfluxDB kind of thing. So uh, the data gets stored in these things. So one more takeaway from this session was how much data do you think will come from, because these are like number of uh, pods, as you call in Kubernetes, and each pod has a sidecar, and from there, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of these pods from where data is flowing. So how do you store this data, and how do you process this data? What, what What's the mechanism of getting these matrix? So, they introduced us to a tool called NIFI, which is short form uh, for Niagara Falls. So it's like taking Niagara kind of data in and then processing that. So uh, finally it is stored in MongoDB. So you can look up NIFI. So that is how you handle large data of logs, traces, and events. So with this, I think we are done halfway. Yes. And yeah. Sit over there. Thanks, Anak. So, um, let's see. Okay. Um, so, you, you, you uh, I think, asked about marketing and sales. Um, I, I think uh, uh, one thing I'll share with you that, that that's a clash that is there in every company or a uh, healthy sparring that is there in every company between sales and marketing and, uh, and kind of the product and product development. Uh, but anyway, uh, I wanted to share this insight um, that about UX, UX again, how it can really uh, help um, uh, increase revenue for, in this case, Tammy Rice uh, uh, gave a talk. She was a product manager at JustWorks. JustWorks is a B2B SaaS company that um, has a payroll benefits HR um, software. Um, and uh, she was charged with uh, increasing their self-service line of business from $750,000 in ARR to $5 million in ARR, annual recurring revenue. Um, uh, long story short, she did it. Uh, we're we're going to go into a little bit of what she did. All, again, very simple stuff. What I want you to take from this is uh, self-service is very important for B2B uh, SaaS companies. Also B2C, but B2B SaaS companies. I won't specifically talk about it, but just look at the results. Um, and then quantify desired outcomes. You need you need those metrics, whether you're gathering from telemetry systems or or, 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 or whatever you're doing, you need to quantify them. You need to be outcome driven, whether it comes from the mission of the company or uh, the value you're delivering to the customer. Um, so one of the first things that she did when she came in was she started measuring and data, the data and, and outcomes. And um, a pre-step to that was building trust, and um, it, it, which is always the first place to start before you come into uh, you know, a situation, a team, an organization, start measuring data. Uh, but she talked a little bit about the goals that, um, that they had uh, when she came in. You know, this was the, uh, the, the uh, funnel for the self-service uh, uh, line of business. They, they wanted to go from a single page to a multi-step smaller pages. Great goal, makes sense. Uh, from lots of fields to uh, fewer fields, um, have less uh, questions uh, to be answered by, by someone who's on a page, etc. Not bad, but not very specific. So she transformed that to a little bit of more actual outcomes, where you go from uh, where you start talking about increasing, let's say, the number of prospects that request a quote within one day of complete, completing registration. And how do you do that? You may, do, this is what you want to achieve, and there are different things in here that you, you might want to do. But it's outcome driven, it, it helps align the organization. 
Um, there's a, uh, I just gave a little blurb on uh, OKR's objectives and key results, really fantastic stuff. Go, go out and read that smart OKR. Uh, use something to be able to measure how you're doing it, but don't be evil. You know, you decide on what you're gonna use and, and, and be outcome driven. What's R dot? On the data to help spot oh. the last R dot is a tool, it's a marketing, marketing. Oh, product. Marketing. Where is that? It's on the fourth. It's it says data to HubSpot. Data uh, to oh, oh, that's current. Okay. Oh, pardon. Yes. It's it's a uh, it's a Salesforce product. Um, so understand and map your funnel. Map out all your steps. She used Envision. You can use PowerPoint, Visio, anything. Stickies. Um, understand what your customers uh, go through um, on their on their journey. Find the leaks because a customer comes to your website. Not everyone signs up. Where are they? Where are you losing them? For an enterprise product, it could be maybe someone go, doesn't go through all the steps of the process fast enough. Um, plug the leaks before you turn on the lap, tap. Um, how do you do that? Mind the fundamentals. Uh, UX fundamentals like above the fold, still hold. Uh, use the same words. Good copy. Uh, use pretty pictures, um, I'll come back to that in a bit. Provide social proof, uh, give someone a reason to use your website, guide the prospect through steps. Um, I, I'm sure most of you already know all of this, and if you don't, this, this is, this is, these are known good things to do in the, in, 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 in the technology, uh, website, startup world, um, and in, 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 in the world of building good products. Um, let's just, do them. Very often we get caught up in just trying to do something really fast that we, we, we who know better uh, forget some of these simple uh, things. Um, just a little bit about the uh, above the fold uh, thing. Uh, you, you all know what that is, right? Mm -hmm. This is the concept that have the most important thing on the front, uh, front page of your website, on the, on the top of your website. There is an increasing body of thought that thinks that uh, it's 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 not it doesn't hold anymore. We've 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 had um, uh, iPhones and, and 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 computers for for a long enough time. We know how to deal with uh, with with web pages. Uh, we're familiar with infinite scrolling. It still holds true. The study by NN um, Group uh, shows that in 2018, 57% of uh, viewing time was still spent uh, above the fold. In 2010, it was about 80 percent, but uh, but now it's um, it's 57 percent, so it's higher, yeah, okay. but not as um, but it's still significant. Uh, you can't ignore this, not yet. <laughs> Mind the copy. Use easy words. Keep it at a sixth to ninth grade level. Um, even if you're very erudite, it helps. <laughs> Um, explain the value along the way. Uh, social proof, um, like what they did was, they were actually working with, um, uh, with big name companies like Aetna, MetLife, et cetera, great brands. Show them, tell them. If no one's heard of you, um, you know, it, it'll make it more reassuring. Use client testimonials. This is from our website. Um, use pretty pictures. Pretty pictures is not just a vanity attribute. <laughs> It's, 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 it's table stakes. Um, we're, we're all used to, or getting used to good UI now. Don't give your, client, your uh, customers this. Have them have, give them something easy to work with. Pretty equals easy in a way. Um, and, but test the meaning with your customers. This might make sense to you and the rest of your developers and your UX and your designers, but, but maybe it doesn't mean the same thing to your customers, test it. I have some more examples down the road. Um, this is a client of ours and a capital factory um, portfolio company. Uh, they are uh, a wonderful team based in Dallas and they have a phone service for seniors. It blocks out spam and, and, and bad calls. Um, they were trying to improve their, their organic Google uh, 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 numbers and they tweaked their website in a very simple way, we all, uh, and actually, you know what, I, I asked a developer, uh, 
I, I showed this to a developer and I tested it, um, and and he didn't fully see the difference between the two, which was an interesting perspective for me to understand. And I was I was glad I heard that perspective, because when I see this, I say, oh my gosh, obviously this is better. It, it's there's more white space. There's it, it looks organized. It's like cleaner. Bigger font. It, bigger font. Yeah. But a developer doesn't always see that. So, so know that as well, because sometimes you, you have to, this is why you need those cross, that's why you need UX in the sprint. Uh, you need that cross, uh, cross uh, functional, what is it? Cross functional team uh, and, and all that diversity of thought, because someone will have a different perspective and for them to understand what you're thinking, for you to understand that, you know, if I say build, build me a pretty page, they might come up with something that looks pretty to them, but is not, what I'm trying to do. Anyway, so um, so they did this and they, they saw some really good results. Uh, he was able to share this with me where they went, they had an improvement of 94% in average time on page and a drop of 17% in bounce rate from that page. And this translated into real revenue dollars for them. A hockey stick. Um, so it, it works. And they said it was like a two hour change, right? It was a two hour change, simple. <laughs> <laughs> Simple, it's out there, it, there, it's good practice, people know, you can, it's, it's on the, it's above the fold in a Google search. You can do this, uh, so do it. Uh, main takeaways, start with measuring what is important. Uh, and fundamental UX rules matter. So what does this have to do with Agile? Our highest priority, do you all know what this is? This, this is from the Agile Manifesto. And this is the first principle that, that supports the Agile Manifesto. Our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of value. And do it with some diversity on the team. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my turn again. Uh, so diversity is something that is uh, very interesting to me because I'm <coughs> I come from one of the higher privileged classes, as everyone knows, right? I'm white, I'm male, I'm tall. also tall. <laughs> and all of these things benefit me tremendously. And so, you know, I, I've thought about, like, at some point in not too long ago, someone mentioned, you know, you got where you were because, you know, you have all this privilege. I'm like, what does that mean? Like, I just worked hard. Isn't that how I got here? So anyway, that's why I'm interested in this, because it is more than that. And we need, you know, it's important for me and everyone to understand that. Um, but this isn't really about diversity, um, this particular talk. It is, but it's actually more about the disclosure piece, right? And I'll tell you what I mean by that. So just let's just imagine that you um, have really bad knees or really sore legs and you, can, you really can't do stairs. It's very uncomfortable for you and you just can't do it. And you are talking to somebody and you're walking along and you approach the situation and you want to go to the right. Um, but imagine if the right wasn't there. There's only stairs. Now you have to stop and talk to the person and say, hey, I, I'm uncomfortable doing the stairs. Can we go look for an elevator, right? That's a really uncomfortable conversation. This may be something you don't want to have to say to anybody. Like, you don't necessarily want to give up that you have this problem, right? So having this situation allows you to naturally just move over to the right, go up the, up the walkway, nobody else, nobody's going to care, and things move on. You do not have to disclose anything. So that's the context. Um, so then there's all these different elements of diversity, right? Um, there's, there's the obvious ones, and then there's hidden ones, right? There's things going on inside people's heads that they just don't want to share, they're uncomfortable sharing, but they're real, they're real issues that um, affect them. And so be aware of this, right? Be aware that we're all, we all have some elements of these, right? I have my hearings failing as I get older, and like I get into a situation where I'm in a, a conversation in a noisy room, I, I have to keep asking people to repeat themselves or I have to ask to walk out of the room. And that's very uncomfortable for me, right? Because it's a new thing for me and it's like, it's just really kind of a problem. So, you know, everyone has some element of this hidden, this hidden thing. So, um, because this was an agile conference, uh, so the, and this, this person, this person is, um, um, she's great. She worked for Apple for a really long time and now she's at Pivotal. And uh, no, so she tried to tie it to like, you know, why, why is this? So this conclusion is like DevOps. So the point there, I think, I'm not 100% sure, 
is that it's kind of everywhere, right? You need it in a whole bunch of different places, but it's not obvious, right? So, um, you know, think about that. And the one key point off this slide that I want to really, uh, I think, hits home is if you've met one person with some kind of uh, situation like deafness, it doesn't mean they're all the same, right? Like, just not every deaf person has the exact same experience, right? So you have to, just because you've interacted with a deaf person, you've had a really positive experience, doesn't mean that's going to work out necessarily the next time. Right, so be very, be very wary of that. Right, like that's that's the real thing. So if you've met one, and you've only met one, uh, I think you know don't out people. That's just kind of a nice thing. Make sure there's psych psychological safety. I mean that's a big overall thing in in diversity now. So a few techniques. Um, I won't go over these in too much detail. I mean yes, end is great. It's an improv technique, but it's it's an inclusive thing. Right, it's like. I understand your point and let's keep talking about this or go in a different direction or whatever. It keeps the conversation open and also acknowledges back that that you understand and you're you know understanding their position. But this is the thing that really was interesting to me is this concept of user manuals. And this is actually a user guide for the human being, right? So everyone on your team answers a common set of questions and you publish it in a con in a place that everyone can see. And this these questions can be like what are your likes, what are your interests? What, what are your challenges, right? Like, I can't hear, so let's not go into a noisy room, right? I can say that in this little user guide and people can understand that and I don't have to actually go through this process every time with every person and explain how to interact with me. And so user guides seem like a really awesome idea. I think this is a huge thing for teams where you really wanna actually get everyone uh, on the same page. There's a couple other things here, just a quick Thing the Strength Finder came from this book, First Break All the Rules. Originally, it was based on a Gallup poll. I love this book. This book is on my desk, and it's mandatory reading for anyone that works for me as a as a manager. It's that good. So um, you know, if you're interested in management topic, it's really not a leadership book. It's a management book, like how best to work with people, have that empathy, and uh, get the most out of them. But Strength Finder is a good thing. This nonviolent communication communication is not the idea that. Don't use words like, you know, phrases like two, uh, kill two birds with one stone. Use instead, uh, feed two birds with one scone. Like I've heard that, that's like a thing these days. <laughs> that's not what nonviolent communication means. This is really about, you know, observing, understanding feelings, needs, and, you know, Okay, so we can still use the two birds and stone, right? Yeah, you, yeah well, in certain circles, I have some friends, I have some friends on the West Coast that don't like that, and they want the stone versus the stones, but like, personally, I don't care, but like, I think you do want to adapt to the people you're talking to and working with. And incidentally, Austin has a center for nonviolent communication, no. which is in Hyde Park. What about him? <laughs> Run by this guy. Wait, 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 I didn't realize that. There's a meeting, um, there are meetings on Sundays which have gone, Austin has the longest standing practice meeting in the world. Um, so it runs on Sundays from 1 to uh, 3.30 and it runs on Monday nights from 7 to 9.15. We've done over 3,000 practice meetings. So I knew that you were in empathy training, but I did not realize nonviolent communication. So this was not a plug for David. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be 100% clear. Excellent. But that's it, good guy. <laughs> yeah, so my final thought is all of, around all of this, power dynamics matter, right? So if you're the leader, realize you have this shadow, and if you're creating this lack of trust, it's not, none of this stuff will work. So. Um, Leader especially has to lead by example and be in front of this. That's it. I think you're next. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, suppose so, so we really need to accelerate. So we'll do quick uh, promise that we'll get over shortly. Yes. So uh, talk about microservices. The biggest challenge in developing microservices to evolve a vocabulary and uh, you know you have to have common language which describes common concepts. And often what happens is you have too much uh, diversity in communication. You know, you have uh, the same concept being described in different words and you end up getting, uh, you don't end up getting your requirements right. So how do you uh, come up with a vocabulary with common understanding? So this session on event storming uh, this was by uh, 
Albert Brandolini. So he is the author of uh, this particular book. Mm -hmm. So what you do is uh, to evolve this or to tease out these uh, what we call as bounded context where you have a separate vocabulary which describes one concept very correctly with the same language and communicate it down the line to everyone so that everyone is on the same page is by having an event storming kind of session. So you gather everyone in the room with a, if you have a fairly complex business, you, you catch all of everyone, gather them in the room and you have orange stickies to describe events and arrange the events from left to right in a time sequence, in a time series. So in this, what's going to happen is that some of the events, the people in the room would not agree that, you know, X follows Y. For example, in our company, uh, there was an event such as raising a purchase order. Uh, normally, on the timeline, it is first you have a quotation and then you raise a purchase order, right? But then there was a discussion that, you know, most of the times in our company, it was like when it came, when the vendor came for payment, to uh, then he was, he was asked, where is the purchase order? And then he would say, okay, to raise the purchase order, I have to give a quotation. So it was actually a reverse flow in reality, though uh, logically the flow should have been in a particular, so it's, what is important here is when you have such anomalies, you put a, a, a red colored or a scarlet sticky that you see here, and you know, you have a number of these scarlet stickies, so what is important is not, uh, not identifying these anomalies, but the conversations that you have around these, and these conversations help you to evolve uh, the, the vocabulary and also to understand uh, what are the bottlenecks in the flow from left to right as the events uh, go. So uh, conversations and voting to identify the bottlenecks. The final outcome of this, so I'll quickly go to the final outcome, is having each bounded context which is a particular uh, concept where you have a unit of language consistency, so you speak the same language, a unit of purpose that the entire bounded context is doing uh, one thing like a department or a section of a company, That's for a unit of responsibility. Services. Yeah. That's like for microservices. No, for, uh, for understanding how to develop my microservice you have to separate out uh, you know these bounded contexts. So to, this is like the design stage before before building the microservice. Yeah. The point of a microservice is you've under you found out that multiple groups are going to be using the same service. It doesn't get embedded within the development team for that particular like accounting or sales. So therefore, since accounting looks at a given term of term differently than sales, you better make darn well sure yeah. that you but, don't. But agree. You know, it's, it's a great point because uh, because it's a microservice for a company. Uh, it's it's a micro piece of what that company does, let's say. Um, and, and then when you get into the development, yes. So that's exactly the reason why you have the entire company in the room, all representatives of account sales, everyone, and then they finally evolve a vocabulary that is commonly understood and that's by that's happening you. within certain industries like healthcare and finance. Yeah. Databases name, but a part of it. And when they had disagreements, they created code books. It was okay. Let's at least tell what they you you used as a dictionary. Right, right, exactly. Like yeah. data element dictionary, yeah. which is the common understanding across. That's a concept. Yeah, that yeah. Yeah. Understanding. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I would say you have a bounded context, and a bounded context. An example of that might be a microservice, right? No, bounded context is something where an example of that could be uh, the process of uh, releasing a purchase order mm -hmm. as opposed to the process of uh, receiving a quotation, mm -hmm. right? Now these two are, like one is happening as a front end with a vendor interaction where a vendor is giving you a quotation. So that is a bounded context and there's a whole process around that. So the vocabulary, the terms that you use there are different from the the purchasing department where the purchase order is being raised. Mm -hmm. So these are typical, like you, you should visualize these as in a physical office. These are different sections of people and then they have their own lingo in which they communicate with each other. And that's the vocabulary that 
is not understood outside of that group. The idea here is to have common ground in which everybody understands that vocabulary so that it can be communicated well across the company. Yes, I was just giving example by using her example yeah. in this um, yeah. general umbrella. Mm -hmm. I think hers is more of a specific, because it's more general. This is arguably one of the most difficult microservices pattern to apply and implement is the boundary yeah. context, and so that's what I was doing in boundary context. Yeah. It was the one just like the same structure. I'm not quite sure. So let's take it offline. Let's talk about it later in the interest of time. These bounded contests communicate with each other. The data is passed uh, using events as the connectors between different bounded contexts. So that's the takeaway here. So you tease out these bounded contexts and the vocabulary, and you have these events communicating with each other. So there are a number of steps in between which I have uh, not talked about. And with this, uh, finally, what you do is how you build a microservice is uh, how you design it is by having uh, a hexagon kind of uh, visualization where everything is external to the business logic. So to keep purity in your business, so you know whatever is your business logic should not get mixed with. Uh, so it is stateless. It should not have. Uh, uh, you know dependencies so all the dependencies are externalized and you just have the uh, core domain inside this so that's why the hexagon serves better than the traditional layered model where your database at the bottom layer then you have middleware then you have the UI and the UX and all that so instead of that you have uh, a hexagon as a better visualization of this mm -hmm. so e everything is external you can see outgoing email persistence which means the database layer the text messaging and all that, then the user interface in terms of uh, web or mobile or whatever. Everything is external and you have the core domain which is uh, stateless that is in the center. So there are a uh, lot of uh, these concepts that uh, we covered. So I skip them for now in the interest of time. Uh, it, this is again the representation of the same concept, uh, externalizing dependencies. Yeah, this I'll let uh, pass on to the uh, to Florence. Yes, thank Agile you. Agile under pressure. Agile under pressure. Thanks, yeah. uh, Vinay. Yeah. And I'm going to do this within two minutes. <laughs> you are under pressure. <laughs> under pressure. Yes. So they they, they 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 took two two years to develop this uh, product. This talk was about two hours long, and I'm going to try and uh, cover this under two minutes. Uh, so, as you can see, we have some really good tools uh, in terms of architecture to help us visualize with the hexagon architecture, etc. Um, uh, and what this team did was, uh, Barco is a company in Belgium. They hired a company in Belgium called In the Pocket to uh, develop this product, which is a medical device. It has a imaging device, a cloud component, and web platform. They were developing four different toolkits, complex. They spent a lot of time uh, aligning, a lot of conversations, uh, a lot of user validations with pictures, with the end users, early on in the process, almost like a design sp sprint separate. Um, they improved, this was my example of going from uh, a, a image that looks great to one that is relevant to the user base. Uh, dermatologists, this doesn't make sense to dermatologists, this makes more sense. Um, and they brought in, um, again, the design track into the development tracks. They interspersed them uh, together. Um, and they had challenges along the way, and they tackled them through conversation and communication um, and incorporating context, demos, and uh, sales pitches. Talk, talk about sales. They come in and kind of mess our product ro roadmap. But um, but, but, but through communication and really understanding all these important dates that are coming up, you can, you can tackle them. Um, and finally, estimates were off by a factor of 10. Um, it happened, as it happened to, okay. Whew, not just that. You jumped over ruthless prioritization. That's right. And it's possible uh, if you make it transparent by telling everyone what you're gonna do. So with that, I'm going to actively listen to your customers and act upon it. And it's never too, change to, too late to change priorities and go straight to number 11, forecasting. <laughs>
don't know if I can do this in two minutes. We'll uh, send out but the, I will the do slides. it as fast, as fast as reasonably possible. Is it going so, to be on the thing? Jill will send out all the slides all uh, yeah, via email. What's that? Yes, yes. And the video, it's live streaming, and um, there'll be a YouTube. So for context, this is the second to the last topic. And the last one is quick. Oh, Guaranteed. <laughs> this one will go pretty fast. The, so the whole goal of forecasting is to do better than you did the last time, but also realizing you're never going to get it, right? Like models are never perfect. Don't, don't try to be perfect. Try to be better. Um, so forecasting using Monte Carlo is the topic here. Um, I'll talk more about what that is, but really it's probabil probabilistic based forecasting where you simulate um, you know, what could possibly happen a whole bunch of times and then use that to figure out what's the likely outcome. If you go the traditional method of like, let's take our throughput, our average throughput, and then multiply it by a number of things we have to get done, you're gonna only have 50% probability, right? Because you've actually planned to the middle, right? So 50% of the time you're gonna fail and 50% of the time you're gonna succeed, um, assuming that nothing bad happens, right? So it's a coin flip. So that's probably not good enough. So um, using historical data and feeding a tool like this Monte Carlo simulator, you actually don't have to get that much data in order to start getting much more accurate uh, probabilities. Um, 11 samples gets you the most bang for the buck. Going over that doesn't really get you much more benefit. And what they found is seven samples um, is is really good enough, right? So if you can get, yes? Sorry, I think I missed something really fundamental. What are you trying to forecast? <laughs> uh, releases. Anything. What about releases? Like, like time how many sprints release? do we need in order to complete this project? Okay, all right. Yeah, that's a good feedback, actually. That wasn't <laughs> clear. And especially in the condensed version of this, that's even less clear. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so you're basically, yeah, it's, you know, what's the date? When are you going to get this stuff done? Here's a pile of stuff. How long is it going to take you to do it, right? We do our best, but it's it's difficult. This, this is an unsolvable problem. It's like maybe NP complete if you're into nerdy um, <laughs> software stuff. But we can try to, in, like with those problems, try to do the best we can. So you don't need a lot of samples. You do need historical data. That's the setup here. So here's the Monte Carlo simulator tool. This is available online. There's actually references to it here. Um, this is like a big thing in uh, Agile community right now. There was six or seven talks related to this topic at, at Agile 2019. But here's, here's the idea. 5,000 sample runs based on your data. You've input your, um, maybe the, the simple thing is you put your low guess, your lowest throughput, your highest throughput, and then it actually just kind of randomly runs these simulations to figure out what your answer is. There is a way to put in your actual seven data points. These were my last seven throughputs. That's good enough. You don't have to cherry pick the data. Just take your last seven. That gives you a better result because if you have two or three 11s and one nine and one eight, it's going to pick 11 more often and give you slightly higher accuracy. Right? So if you have better, um, tighter variance. So over here, you get the results, right? So 85% or better is considered high, you know, in statistics, considered high likelihood, right? So you, you want to strive for that green. Anything less than that, you're, you're asking for trouble. Um, top reasons forecast fails. I think number two might be the first <laughs> most important one because it actually affects the one ahead of it and the one below it and possibly the last one, which is the leader doesn't like it. That's not the answer I wanted, so go back and think about it some more and then give me the answer I wanted, right? But you're never gonna win in that situation. Like, that's a human problem that you can't win. Cognitive bias is just the idea that you're gonna cherry pick data that gives you the outcome you think you want. Like, and a lot of times that's affected because you think the leaders are gonna want a faster time, so let's take some data that's actually gonna make it look better, right? So don't do that. Just use the last seven pieces of data. Uh, the other ones are kind of obvious. This is the whole whip question, right? Don't have too much work in progress because, you know, we know like if you're on an Austin road and there's too many cars on it, it's going to take you forever to get over the bridge. Like that's just the reality of the situation. So that's, that's with in action. And that's it. All right. My claim starts and all. Yeah. <laughs> We're distracted. <laughs> Right, so this was the experiment that uh, the, the Chris Bailey was a keynote speaker who uh, 
All right. Okay. So you're going. Actually, gonna start the timer. Yeah, actually, gonna start the timer. You had it going. Yeah, had it going. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so Chris, Chris Bailey uh, was the keynote speaker who conducted all these experiments, like I mentioned, like living in isolation, working 90-hour weeks, watching Netflix for one month, <laughs> right? Gaining 15 pounds of muscle, etc. So, you know, what he is trying to do here is to get focus, right? How to how how not to get distracted and how to get focused. So he was trying to do everything possible, and uh, you know he studied how human mind gets distracted. So his conclusions are like, you know, our mind craves distraction every 40 seconds. So that's when you look at your mobile phone and look at the notifications. It gives you a dopamine hit. But the next conclusion is that when he did the experiment when he got bored and you know so those experiments showed that brilliant plans and ideas come when your mind is wandering when you have nothing specific and you know so when your energy is low that's when brilliant ideas come when your energy is high that's when execution happens uh, mind wanders 40 percent of the times in future 12 percent in past 20 percent 28 percent in present and 12 percent of the time your mind is blank and distraction isn't the main enemy of focus. It is the overstimulation that after you get distracted by that uh, beep on your phone, you go and start chatting on WhatsApp with your friend. And that gets you stimulated, that you know keeps you awake. So, yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so these are the insights uh, we gained in this session. Thank you. And with that, I think, shall we? Thanks a lot. Yeah, we'll we'll the sorry, we'll stop here. Yeah, we'll stop here. Okay. Um, yeah. um, just a real quick reminder, this was recorded, live stream, and so you can go check out the recording at Capital Factory's YouTube site. I will send this out, but not till Monday, because we still want to tweak it based on tomorrow's feedback. Um, and there's a couple little capitalization things that are just bugging me. I have to fix it before I send it out. Um, and then we also are going to have a webinar on this same topic condensed down to one hour. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Right. Um, but you'll receive an email on that or if you want to forward it to anybody. But I'd like to really thank Florence and Vinayak and Mike. They put a lot of effort into this this weekend because we just got back Friday night. And to deliver it starting on Tuesday was a lot of effort. So thank you very much.